Hello, let's see here. Uh, welcome to uh, Baobab Press's uh, live event um, for Small Fair. Uh, thank you to Jesse Bender and her crew over there for organizing all of these uh, events and meetings and all these wonderful presses. Uh, it's been a great week uh, of events um, and we've been really excited to be a part of it. Um, this is our third Small Fair event. Um, and if you're watching this on our uh, Sundance Books uh, YouTube live channel, uh, you can watch uh, those other events as well as any of our other Sundance Books events uh, on this channel. Um, today we have the Arts and Sciences featuring Felicity Muth and Alexa Lindauer uh, with their book, Am I Even a B, uh, which are gorgeous and we've got in recently. Um, we're happy to share with you on April 5th, uh, which is when they go for sale. They are currently available for pre-order at your local independent bookstore and uh, wherever you buy your books. Uh, we're very excited to get those out in the world to you. Um, we're going to start off uh, the, with Felicity um, and then have a little reading and then get into Alexa and followed by some uh, Q&A. If you have questions for the authors or about the book, uh, please write them in the comment section of the uh, YouTube channel page, and we'll be sure to relay, to relay those to the author and illustrator at the end of the event. Uh, otherwise, sit back and enjoy. Uh, Dr. Felicity Muth is an assistant professor of animal behavior and cognition at the University of Texas at Austin. Originally from London, Felicity did her PhD at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland before discovering her passion for bees at the University of Arizona and University of Nevada, Reno where she held postdoctoral research positions. Felicity is an, also an award-winning popular science writer and is published in Scientific American, as well as being interviewed on NPR Science Friday, and she currently resides in Austin, Texas. Uh, Alexa Lindauer works as the project and laboratory manager at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory through the University of California, Santa Barbara. She studies disease in amphibians and currently works to restore populations of endangered frogs in California. She holds an MS in biology from the University of Nevada, Reno, and a BA in biology from Bowdoin College with a minor in visual arts. Alexa spends her free time exploring her Sierra Nevada backyard as a backcountry skier and trail runner, and her love of the outdoors and wild places motivates much of her scientific research, which focuses around conservation. She uses art as a tool to connect people to science and the natural world. She currently resides in Mammoth Lakes, California. And we're very excited to have them both with us here today. Uh, so I give a virtual round of applause for uh, Felicity and Alexa. Great, thank you. Um, so I am gonna go ahead and start my presentation. If you um, could just tell me, give me a thumbs up that you can see, yeah, the slides, okay. Um, okay, brilliant. So yeah, so I'm Felicity Muth. I, uh, I wrote this book, Am I Even a Bee? But I'm also a, a bee biologist. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that because I think that um, this book is kind of a logical extension of the research I do, the themes I think about day to day. So, like I mentioned, I'm a bee scientist, uh, but I've also always just been really keen on science communication. So this was during the first March for Science in 2017. I thought I would use this as an opportunity to get to do a bit of community outreach. Um, here I am at an event in Reno during Pollinator Week, chatting to some kids about bumblebees. And um, as Neela mentioned, during my PhD, I wrote for Not, uh, Scientific American. I had a blog there called Not Bad Science. And I've done some freelance articles and been interviewed on the radio. And, and for me, as a scientist, uh, science communication is kind of just this, this great counterpart because there's so many scientists doing all kinds of great research, but if we're not communicating it to people, then nobody really knows. And so I think that for me, I've always just been really passionate about communication side of science as well as doing the actual research. Um, so nowadays I'm an assistant professor at UT Austin. And so here is my wonderful lab uh, showcasing the daily temperature fluctuations of Austin, Texas. 
And in the lab, we mostly work with bumblebees. So this is a bumblebee colony. Uh, for those of you who have got good eyesight, you might notice that some of the bumblebees have got little numbers on them, and that's how we keep track of individuals. This big bee here is the queen at the bottom of the And we work in the lab, we also work in the field. So here I am at one of our field sites in Reno, Nevada. And, uh, and the nice thing about, about the West of the United States is there are so many different bees and so many different bumblebees that I'm gonna talk more about in a minute. Okay, so before we get started, um, I'm gonna ask you just to think of a bee. And there's a good chance that you'll think of a bee that looks like this. So this is a honeybee. And honeybees are really important in our agriculture, but they're actually not native to the US. But in America, we have so many uh, native bees, so many different species. And of course, yeah, these bees are also, there's wonderful diversity worldwide, but because I live in America, I'm gonna focus on North America. Um, this, these, these, these are pictures taken from Bees in Your Backyard by Joe Wilson and Olivia Messenger Carroll, which is a wonderful guide to uh, native bees in North America if anybody's interested in learning more about them. So I work with one particular group, bumblebees, of which there are around 50 different species in North America. And bumblebees, we use them to pollinate our food. Uh, so for example, they pollinate tomatoes that honeybees can't pollinate. They also pollinate uh, squash and strawberries, but they're also really important in our native ecosystems. So I use bumblebees to study cognition. And when I tell people that I work on, on bumblebee cognition, I normally get asked one of two different questions. So the first one is, why would you use a bee to study cognition? Why wouldn't you study this in a human or a crow or some animal that seems smarter than a bee? And the other question I get asked is why are all the bees dying? And so I'm gonna try and briefly answer these two questions because uh, these are two things that we, we broadly study in my lab. So the first is why would you use a bee to study cognition? Well, so bumblebees are generalist foragers and that means they visit many different types of flower. And so you can see in these pictures here that flowers vary, of course, they vary in how they look, how they smell, and they also vary in the rewards they offer to bees. And so if you're an individual bee, it makes sense that as you visit these different flowers, you should be learning which of these have got the best rewards. And we know that when a bee visits a flower, it can learn all kinds of features, like the scent of the flower, visual cues, like the color or the pattern or the shape, temperature cues, texture cues, and it can even learn about the electric field around a flower. And so bees, and bumblebees in particular, are really good at learning. So when we work on learning in bumblebees, we have to train them in the lab. And so to do that, we, we take a bee and we put a number on its back so we can keep track of the bee. Um, and then we might present it with different colors of flowers. For example, if you're interested in learning about uh, training a bee to color, where one color might be rewarding and the other one is unrewarding. And so here is an example of what one of our artificial flowers looks like. Here's a bumblebee collecting cherry pollen off of this flower. Um, and her tongue comes out there, you might have seen that. She regurgitates nectar to pack it, her pollen into these little pollen loads on her back legs. Pretty simple methods here. These uh, pipe cleaners were bought from Michaels. During my, my postdoc, I think the Michaels people probably thought I was crazy because every week I would come down to the shop and buy all of their brown pipe cleaners. It's the most boring craft project ever. But we use these flowers to look at whether bees could learn associations with pollen in the same way that they learn about nectar. And so I'm gonna show you a video now of training a bee to learn that. So here's a slow down video of a bee flying into our arena and she's checking out these blue flowers because they like the color blue, but there's no pollen on any of those flowers. She then finds the cherry pollen on that yellow flower and she stops to collect it. And so I give a bee opportunity to collect pollen from these different yellow flowers and in doing so, she learns that these yellow flowers have got pollen. But how do we know this? The way that we test animals in learning experiments is to take away the rewards, we take away the pollen, and look to see if she still goes to the yellow flowers. And so now I'm gonna show you of a bee, a video of a bee that was trained to yellow flowers. 
But like I said, there's no pollen now on any of these flowers. But you can see really clearly that she's searching on these yellow flowers. I always feel a bit mean at this point in the experiment as the bee is trying to find that pollen. Okay, and so, um, like I said, bees are really good at learning, which is one of the reasons we use them to study cognition. They also have a whole host of other cognitive abilities. And so if this is something you're interested in, I would recommend this popular science book that came out recently by Lars Chitka that talks about all these amazing abilities that bees have. Okay, and so then to address the other question I often get asked, which is why are all the bees dying? Well, there are two main drivers of wild bee declines. There's many other variables as well, but these are two of the big ones, uh, habitat loss and use of pesticides. And these two things are often linked because as we convert land into agricultural land, these are both losing their habitat often and also being exposed to agrochemicals. And so pesticides, and in particular, one group has been uh, these neonicotinoids or neonics. Uh, ones that we've studied a bit in my lab. And so these pesticides are, are largely banned in the EU, but still a really commonly used pesticide in the US. If you go into a supermarket, uh, there's a good chance that, um, you know, many of the things you buy have been treated, the seeds have been treated with these neonics. And we know that these negatively affect uh, bee behavior, reproduction, and are linked to bee declines and insect declines more broadly. And these neonics are now being replaced by other insecticides, um, in some cases because of pest resistance, in other cases because they've been banned. But these replacement pesticides are often just as bad for bees. Okay, and so having said that, um, people are often talking about saving the bees, right? People have heard about bee declines and they want to help. But one of the things that often frustrates us as bee biologists are things like this. So in these pictures, um, something you might notice is the bees that are being depicted are honeybees. And so, like I mentioned, honeybees are these domesticated commercial non-native bees that we use in our agriculture. But really they're not, um, there are all these other native bees that are suffering declines because of human activities. And so in the bee community, we kind of nerdily called this bee washing. You might have heard of green washing, where companies um, you know, kind of claim to be uh, doing something for ecology, but really it's, it's a little bit superficial. Um, not to you know, point finger at any one company, but there are many companies that claim to be saving the bees and then really focus on honeybees, which aren't the ones we should be worried about. We should really be worried about all the other native bees um, that are supporting our ecosystems. So um, just to tell you a bit more about those bees, um, so as I mentioned, um, this is our domesticated honeybee that's non-native. It's the one that we use so much in agricultural pollination. We ship these guys all around the country to pollinate certain crops, but it doesn't have to be that way. There are all these other native bees, 20,000 species worldwide, around 4,000 species in the US. And these bees are important agricultural pollinators. We tend not to think of them as that because we have so much focus on the honeybee. But the great thing about native bees is that they will often do the job for free. If they're in the area and they're being supported by uh, native habitat, they will come to the crops and they will visit them and they will pollinate crops for free. But they're also obviously super critical for our native ecosystems because they've evolved alongside the plants that they pollinate. And um, you know, without those plants, whole ecosystems would collapse. And so we tend to think of bees um, you know, in, a, in a hive or maybe in a, in a tree, but actually most native bees nest in the ground and most of them are solitary, they're not part of a hive. And so on the right here is a diagram of how that might look. So there is a, um, a nest in the ground with an adult bee and some eggs and larvae bees developing. And here are some ground nesting bees sticking their little heads out of their, their holes in the ground. And so one of the bees that nests in cavities um, is Osmia, the mason bee. 
And so Osmia is, is the genus name of, of the bee, but it's also the name of our protagonist in our book. And so these bees, depending on the species, can nest in all kinds of different cavities. There's one that's wonderful that nests inside um, seashells, for example. And this is just one group of native bees. There are many other native bees. So here are the ones that uh, we chose to represent in the book. And these bees, of course, look, uh, sorry, on the left here, we have illustration from the book by Alexa Lindauer. And then on the right is the photograph of the actual bee taken by Alex Wild. And so these bees obviously vary a lot in how they look, the color that they are, and they also vary a lot in their, in their lifestyle. And so if you're interested to read more about these different bees, I have some information on them on our website. And the link is up here now. Okay, and so because I always get asked about this, I'm just going to briefly say ways that we can support native bees. So a big one is, of course, to pl um, plant flowers. If you plant native annuals and perennials in your garden, you're supporting your native bees. And if we all did this instead of having lawns, this could make a massive difference. And so if you're interested in doing more of this, I would refer you to these two uh, societies, Xerxes Society and the Pollinator Partnership, who have a ton of information on native plants for your area and planting guides. Uh, as somebody who's a very messy gardener and kind of a lazy gardener, I love this. You can basically let your garden be a little bit wild and it is great for bees. In different places for bees to nest, um, both in the ground and in trees, lots of flowers, wildflowers for food. And then of course, avoiding using pesticides. What is crazy is that you can walk into Home Depot and buy any number or pesticide that is totally lethal. Um, of course, it's you know, been designed to kill insects, so it's not really surprising that it's bad for insects like bees. Um, but also, uh, people will buy these tick dog collars. Uh, this is Dave Gawson, who's a famous bumblebee biologist and kind of advocate, uh, talking about one of these dog collars uh, that contains enough of a neonic to kill 1 billion honeybees. And so, so really avoiding the use of these chemicals in your garden is a big way to help save the bees. Okay, and so then the inspiration from, from the book really came from just wanting the next generation of, of humanity to know about all these other bees. And I think that that could just be a really good step towards helping protect them. You know, I don't think, People focus on honeybees. Uh, I think that the focus on honeybees is really often just because people don't know about all the other wonderful bees that are out there. And so here is a bunch of us at um, a field site near Reno last summer. And one of the most heartwarming moments for me was when uh, my friend's kid, who was about three or four at the time, caught a bee and then told me it was Osmia and he was right. So that was wonderful. All right, so thank you. Um, that's the end of my little presentation. And now I'm just going to read uh, the first, the start of the book. Okay, here we go. So in a meadow at the end of last spring, Osmia's mother laid an egg in a bed of pollen. She tucked Osmia in and left her a note for when she was grown. A year later, all grown up, Osmia still lived in the same meadow, visiting flowers every day to collect nectar and pollen. He loved to buzz through the flowers. Nectar from the blue ones was a favorite. But lately, Osmia had been feeling uneasy. Everywhere she looked, she saw bees, and not just in her meadow. Bees in magazines, bees on t-shirts, and even children wearing bee costumes. What made Osmia feel troubled was that those bees all looked the same. What's more, even some of the flies, moths, and beetles in the meadow looked like those bees, but Osmia did not. Those bees were round, Osmia was slender. Those bees were fluffy, her hair was patchy. Those bees were yellow and black, she was bluey green. Those bees were social, always hanging out in a group. Osmia lived alone in a hole. Osmia had an idea. If flies and moss could pass as bees, maybe she could too. If she could just look more like them, then she would fit in. She painted herself with yellow stripes and stuck on some fluff she found in an old bird's nest. It didn't work. Suddenly, Osmia was startled by a swarm of bees buzzing by her home. 
Pardon me, excuse me, out of the way, the honeybee said. So much for some quiet time to think, sighed Osmia. Osmia flew around her meadow to sort her thoughts, landing on a flower. Her mother's note said she was a bee, but Osmia wasn't so sure. She began to wonder if she was even a bee at all. All right, thank you. I will now uh, pass it to Alexa, who's gonna tell us about um, art and the amazing illustrations she did for this book. Thanks, Felicity. Um, yeah, I'll dive in and share my screen and share a little bit about my own journey uh, as a scientist and an artist and finding that balance both for myself personally and then also within the illustrations in the book. Okay, looks good. Whoops, whoops, not looking so good. Okay, can you see the presentation? Great. So today I'll start talking a little bit again about how I balance science and art personally in my life. And then I'll touch a little bit on using art as a tool for communicating science. As Felicity said, there's so much great research that occurs, but so little sharing of it. And I think art is a really powerful tool to make science um, and biology really accessible. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about finding a balance in the illustrations that I did between scientific accuracy and making bees and insects seem more approachable and relatable. So for me personally, I've always tried to find a balance between science outdoors and art in my life. And this has been going on for as long as I can remember. And here's a very early example of one of my illustrations. Um, definitely didn't go into a career in politics, but that central drive of wanting to be part of conservation and engaging in the natural world uh, was something that I felt even at a very young age. Um, I think also the paired dress and sweatpants with binoculars on a beach day is a pretty clear indication of a wildlife biologist in the making. But this thread continued on through college where I majored in biology but minored in art and then continued to pursue my outdoor endeavors in my summers working on a trail crew in New Hampshire. And all of those passions eventually led me to my current position where I work for the Mountain Lakes Research Group recovering alpine amphibians in the Sierra Nevada. And this is incredibly, incredibly rewarding work for me. I get to run a qPCR lab and manage data, but I also get to work in some really, really beautiful places that are very, very important and special to me. And that connection that I have to the mountains and to the outdoors helps inform and motivate the science research and recovery and conservation work that I do. So here on the right, we have the mountain or Sierra yellow-legged frog in a high elevation lake in Kings Canyon is about 11,000 feet. She's a real beauty. Um, and then me on the left, I have a frog in my left hand that had been collected from uh, a lake as a tadpole um, carried by a helicopter out of the wild to the San Francisco Zoo, reared in captivity, um, and then returned via helicopter to be reintroduced into a lake um, to try and grow the populations of these endangered species. So if you look over here on the left, uh, this is one of the sites where these, these frogs reside. So, you know, I'm definitely outing myself as not a bee biologist by any means. Uh, my focus is pretty heavily in wildlife disease and in amphibians, um, but I have a very, very strong connection to science and to the outdoors. Uh, but how about the art component? Um, so when I was in college, I minored in art. I just couldn't seem to let go of that passion and desire that I had for the arts. And that background was very heavily rooted in fine arts. 
a lot and a lot of figure drawing, printmaking, oil painting. Um, but when you leave college, it's a lot harder to find opportunities to make large pieces of fine art if that's not your profession or to find a place to do figure drawing. So I personally started to pivot more toward drawing things that I was seeing in nature or painting. Um, sometimes it was because they made nice gifts. Sometimes they brought me joy in uh, sort of diving further into some of the organisms I was studying or observing in the wild. And this natural progression sort of led to me using art for a tool for communicating science in my professional work. And one example I have of that um, is through scientific peer-reviewed publications and using art to help describe systems. And in this case, it's about uh, the interaction between the immune system and some stress hormones in frogs as they metamorphose and go through their different life stages. So being able to literally draw a picture of um, a process that's occurring in nature um, can be a really, really helpful tool to communicate results. And I extend that sometimes even further to models um, in papers to, again, tell a visual story um, to explain the data that we're trying to present in a more accessible way. And that's within the scientific community. Um, but then luckily, through opportunities like this incredible book that Felicity wrote, uh, there's the opportunity to share science with a younger and also older through parents' audience um, in a different way. And what's really, really important or was important for me in illustrating Am I Even a B is to find a balance between scientific accuracy and education and also making bees relatable. I know as a child, I loved to catch spiders and feed ants to ant lions and hold caterpillars, but not every child likes insects or bees or bugs um, and neither do their parents. And I think making bees feel relatable was really, really important to me in this process. Um, and I will share personally uh, being new to bees, but focusing more on them in this illustrating process that in my own field work, I started to notice bees and bee mimics more when I was out in the mountains this past summer and finding greater appreciation for them. So I hope that the readers that they might even be will start to experience some of those same things. So here on the right, we have our protagonist, Asmia, and definitely trying to find that balance between some scientific accuracy and also some relatable emotions of feeling a little bit lost and confused, as I think we all have. So here's an example of one of the illustrations later in the book where Osmia and her sort of spirit guide, a carpenter bee named Zyla, go through ways in which they think they look similar. And they come to realize throughout the book that bees have these two big eyes on the sides of their heads, three eyes on the top, <laughs> missing the teeth, three body segments, four wings, and, and six legs. And, and this makes you a bee, not being green or being black or being big or being small. And then again, pulling on that fine art background, I tried really hard not to make the bees have human faces, but still be able to express human emotions through gesture and body movement. So we see that a little bit here where we've got somewhat of a proud honeybee on the left. And again, a sort of dismayed, sad, confused Osmia on the right, trying to figure out her place. Again, finding that balance and sort of um, breakover between science and also what kids may feel in their day-to-day -day lives is this concept of a mimic. So in science and in nature, sometimes insects will mimic um, another species or organism that has some special characteristic um, that helps keep them safe. So here we have mimics that may, um, that may uh, look like our honeybees or bumblebees, but don't actually have the characteristics of those and that may help protect them from predation or otherwise. Um, but Osmia is feeling pretty left out and kids see this all the time. 
I'm not sure if the Mean Girls reference is still appropriate, but oftentimes kids will try to fit in in a lot of different ways um, through mimicking those who they admire. And there's a balance between fitting in, but also embracing yourself and who you are. And that uh, message, I think, is something that really comes through in the words that Felicity wrote. And I tried to illustrate alongside. Another challenge, how do you make a larva relatable? <laughs> Um, or an egg for that matter. And again, personally, I find how Osmia builds nests to be really, really cool, um, but maybe not the most relatable for every reader. So trying to find ways in which um, part of the science can, can feel relatable and comfortable, but still be depicting something that's accurate or true. So again, I'd say a, an example of how I, um, found a balance in illustration through my own personal um, art and science endeavors was through the how I chose to portray flowers in this book. Uh, so when I'm out in the field looking for frogs and backpacking on and off trail in the high Sierra, I come across amazing wildflowers in the alpine and montane meadows that I travel through. Um, and I am not a botanist by training, but I try to learn some of the plants around me. And I definitely have come to very much appreciate them and their beauty, sometimes in unexpected ways. So when painting um, the illustrations for Am I Even a Bee, I wanted to try and highlight some of the wildflowers and actually try to paint them uh, in a somewhat accurate way. The flowers themselves, but also the ways in which they're grouped um, and which flowers you may actually see together in the wild if you were to go out on a hike or a walk. And also trying to match the appropriate bees to the flowers that perhaps you could see them pollinating in the wild. So this was part of the process of illustrating some of these flowers um, and including that detail and how special they really are. And again, paired with the bees, who are pollinating them or visiting them um, in pairings that could actually be observed in the wild. And then finally, as Felicity pointed out about um, creating opportunities to have children and their parents be more involved in uh, or engaged with their environment and, and paying attention to it. Um, I think children are natural observers and some of the best scientists. They're incredibly curious they're great at asking questions. They don't have a filter yet to be embarrassed. And sometimes they ask the best science questions. So in that, um, as a biologist myself, um, there's a lot of power in observation. So in this left image, there's a spider pretty obviously sitting in this mimulus or yellow monkey flower right here. And then in the lower right, we have a bird's nest snuck in among the gravel. And then for those of you with good eyes, hopefully you can see the toad, the Yosemite toad hiding in this mossy bank. And I tried to create opportunities when illustrating this book for children to be natural observers. And when I was a child, one of my favorite parts of being read to was when one of my parents would ask me to find things within an illustration. So trying to create moments like that throughout the book where children could be curious. And that's all I have for you today. That was awesome. Um, thank you both uh, Alexa and Felicity for those presentations. They're uh, so amazing. We were uh, sort of pre-gaming this uh, event yesterday and uh, one of the uh, more spectacular things uh, uh, of uh, both of you is how, how incredibly busy you are and thank you again for you know taking the time not only to be here but to make those awesome presentations um yeah so some questions uh we have going on you talked a lot about the why uh, uh wonderfully you know as far as conservation goes and um the, how to make or why you're making representation um, um, of the bees be appealing to, to children. Um, 
on the maybe the other side of that, can either of you speak a little bit to your process uh, in both uh, painting, drawing, and or writing? Um, and if that is advised anyway by your uh, scientific practices, or if it's a completely different um, method that you go about doing your, your creative projects? I'll go first, then I'll pass it to you, Alexa. So I think one of the things that people don't often know about science is that it is actually a really creative process um, because a lot of, I guess, ultimately what we're trying to do is understand why the world is the way it is. And so in doing so, when we design experiments, you have to be pretty creative, both in the kind of questions that you ask and then how you go about asking those questions. And so I think that actually there's often a lot of crossover between science and creative thinking that people don't always appreciate. Um, and so to me, they really kind of do tie together. And obviously there are, you know, there are differences. You have more freedom in a way when you're doing something like this. Uh, but yeah, but, I, but for me, it kind of is, yeah, a bit of a mishmash. <laughs> what about you, Alexa? Yeah, I would agree that there is a lot of crossover between the sciences and the arts in, in the creativity, as you mentioned, in designing an experiment or coming up with a composition or a passage of writing, um, but also in more of those somewhat technical skills of, of observing um, and paying close attention to detail that, that really come across in, in both fields. And for me, I think there's some of the, there's a freedom um, in the art that maybe isn't always there in science, especially with some parts of science that have some very specific protocols um, that are really set in stone. Um, but at the same time, I, as an artist, create rules for myself or systems for myself, um, both to stay organized and on time, somewhat within deadlines, lots of spreadsheets and, and notes and things like that. Um, but also about how I go about creating consistent images, osmia or the flowers that um, she lands on or the other bees she interacts with should look somewhat similar throughout the book and have somewhat of a language. Um, and that was also true in creating some of the rules for how to anthropomorphize bees that um, the three of us and others in the publishing house work to sort of build. So uh, maybe a bee is allowed to wear sunglasses, but they're not allowed to wear human clothing, or they can move or act in a certain way, but their eyes will always be somewhat bee eyes and will never look like human eyes with whites and an iris and a pupil. Um, so how to make the bees be as bee-like as possible. Uh, we definitely had some rules and constraints that we built, which is process oriented and, and maybe somewhat of the, the more science-sided brain in me. Yeah, I think one of the more useful things for a creative process, right, process is right, the, the idea of constraints, which is uh, mm -hmm. really interesting. And in hear how in the creating of the, the images, you almost had to dial back, you know, what the anthropomorphizing of the bees um, to make them less, I don't know, cartoonish to, to some degree, right? Um, I was going to go off that. So you, you had your singular processes before, but this is the first time, at least to my knowledge, that you possibly work, have worked together on a, a creative process or, or on a book. Um, actually, I don't know if that's true with you, Alex. I think you have another book. Um, to, but uh, more to the point, how did your processes change, you know, working with each other, um, you know, working with Baobab? Uh, did that uh, require in so any sort of, you know, adaptation on your part? Yeah, well, I had never written a children's book before. And so it was great to be able to work with um, Baobab and people who are experts in this to kind of um, refine, <laughs> refine the, the, the story and the style. And, um, and, you know, thinking about you know, what are the key messages we want to get across? And then what is the, the best way to, to put that around the narrative? And of course, like the story itself is, you know, the, the science part is, is not the, the main story. The, the main story is about diversity and uh, how it's fine to be different, how you don't have to fit into this narrow mold. 
Um, and then the kind of byproduct of that is that hopefully kids will learn about different types of views as going through that, that story. Um, and so it was super fun. It was really fun, uh, the four of us sitting down and working on uh, the, the nitty gritty together and envisioning how it was gonna come together in terms of the, the visuals. Um, yeah, it was, it was great. And it was so much fun to, to collaborate on. Yeah, I think it was a lot of fun and a, a different type of project to work on that I think Felicity and I are, are used to. And a big part of our writing and publishing process um, are peer-reviewed scientific publications. And it's a um, really important process. I think critical to good science to be well peer-reviewed, but it can be really crippling. <laughs> you could spend years of your life, some people decades, producing a body of work and then maybe another year to write it up and then you submit it and um, you may get rejected outright. You may um, have reviews that are pretty scathing and it can be a really hard process. Um, and I'm sure there are parts of that that occur in uh, the work of um, the world of children's books as well. But working with Baobab was really lovely in our, our first pitch meeting, um, Felicity and I had no idea what to expect. We had her manuscript and one mock illustration that I had done along with some of my past more science related illustrations. And we were met with such warmth and excitement. And um, I don't think either of us quite expected that. And uh, I think we actually looked pretty perplexed and had to explain why we looked perplexed. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it has definitely been a real, um, a real pleasure to work on. Well, that warms the, the cockles of our hearts to, to hear that. Uh, that's awesome. Um, it's been great. And I, you know, one of the fun things is, uh, you know, it's always sort of uh, the marketing end of things and getting uh, authors out in the field. Um, uh, oftentimes much more reluctantly than you two attacked the field. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, some stories. I'm thinking one, you know, specifically of uh, Felicity, um, who's from the UK and went on a reconnaissance mission for us. Do you, would you tell us that story, Felicity? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Going to... Oh, God. Well, I mean, I feel like as scientists, we kind of are used to hustling a bit, maybe. I don't know. Um, you have to not, I don't know. I didn't have any shame in walking into bookshops with uh the uh the proofs of our book and asking people to uh <laughs> if they would if they would have it in their shop <laughs> and i'll do more of that in the future <laughs> yeah that was uh, it was amazing um and uh you know sort of a, a boots on the ground aspect of the of the process that might not be so um obvious when publishing books right um and much appreciated on our end uh that's off the point, though. And another thing that you all are doing, not only were you pitching this, I believe right before you came in or right after you came into the office that first time, right, we uh, went into lockdown um, for the pandemic um, and uh, Alexa was moving. Um, Alexa, can you tell us a little bit about that process, you know, uh, creating the, not only creating the illustrations, but, you know, uh, working during the pandemic and, you know, all of the other things. Yeah, of course. I think um, illustrating my first children's book during the pandemic was uh, somewhat of a blessing and a curse in that um, when you have an extra project on your plate, but maybe less bandwidth for it, that can be difficult. And it can also be hard to create positive and warm illustrations when maybe you don't feel that way yourself. Um, but art for me, since um, I don't know, maybe post-college has been um, a lot of what I call the, the bathtub syndrome, where if you're a small child and you're told you're supposed to take a bath, um, you may kick and scream uh, and really try and avoid getting in that bathtub. But once you're in, you do not want to leave and it's the best place in the world. Um, and I have some of that tension sometimes with art where it's hard for me to start. But then once I do, I just, I don't want to stop. So. I think illustrating during the pandemic, sometimes it was hard to sit down and start a composition, but at the same time, 
it was really nice to have to. And then once I started, it was an excellent distraction and a really positive part of my life during that time. Um, in addition to the pandemic, uh, these illustrations have survived four forest fires and two floods. <laughs> um, so I did the bulk of these illustrations in Colorado, but was working in the summers in California and um, had terrible, terrible wildfires here. Returned to Colorado only to be uh, surrounded by three separate wildfires in the town of Estes Park um, and evacuated from our homes. And the illustrations came along and uh, in that evacuation process and the need to just escape wildfire smoke and wildfire season as is the case on the west coast um, my husband and I and the illustrations drove all the way east to visit family and then all the way back um, west to California so the physical original illustrations have traversed the country twice excellent work yeah uh quite the track that it's fun to say that the books already traveled thousands of miles before, you know, it reaches people's hands. Um, but, but that's kind of a segue to change gears a little bit, you know, to the larger um, ramifications of the book, you know, obviously it's talking about uh, species decline and, and, you know, involved with climate change and, and things of that nature, you know, with the fire, uh, the fires in California. Um, and you have obviously embraced, um, you know, the aspect of sort of uh, turning these larger things into a, a metaphor or, you know, working really hard to get folks to um, recognize themselves uh, in these sort of issues. Uh, but I wonder, as, as scientists, does that ever become frustrating for you that maybe the facts aren't, uh, don't seem like enough in the face of these larger issues and you have to go the extra mile to, to get people to relate um yes <laughs> yes it's <laughs> frustrating um and that was actually kind of the reason that i decided to write the book um i mean just to actually quickly speak to the climate change thing with the with the wildfires for example a couple of years ago i was working with bumblebees um near reno nevada and we i was catching queens and measuring queen bumblebee behavior at, at this one particular location we work at and then a couple, a few months later, I wanted to go back to get the workers that those queens produce. And the entire site had just burned, all the flowers were gone. Um, and so as scientists, you know, Alexa and I both work in kind of similar ecosystems. It's something that we really just see all the time. Um, you know, every year, uh, the, the crazy stuff that's happening with the climate. Uh, separate to that, yeah, the, as a, as a, I think any biologist, right, is just extra aware of all the things that are happening. Like I said, I work on, you know, human driven change and how that affects bees. But, you know, if you work on plants, you're probably extra cute into climate change. Um, we're all very aware of, of how human driven change is affecting our ecology. And yeah, that can be kind of depressing sometimes. And so I think that, you know, for me, I had just finished this job as, as a postdoctoral re researcher at University of Nevada, Reno. I had a few months until I was gonna start my, my new job as an assistant professor. And I was really kind of thinking about the work that I had done and the papers I had written. And, you know, we work on often one topic for our whole lifetime, and it can be boiled down to two sentences in a book at the end of the day. Um, and so really just thinking about the impact that we're having on the world and how we're changing it for the better. And for me, I was, I was kind of in my apartment one night and thinking, well, if I could just write a children's book and if just, I don't know, a few hundred to a few thousand children could know that there are more bees out there than just the honeybee, I think that could potentially have larger impact than my whole career in science. <laughs> and that's not to diminish, um, you know, my research or, or, or science in general, but it's kind of how it works often that, um, you know, we're making small incremental discoveries rather than, um, you know, having one giant impact, like being able to educate kids about, about diversity. Yeah, 
Yeah, and I agree with Felicity sharing some of that same frustration, but um, may sound a little cliche, but we we only have one planet and <laughs> we're all sharing it. And um, there are a lot of things that we as humans are doing to destroy it. And I am not outside of that equation. I drive a non-electric vehicle. Sometimes I fly in airplanes. Uh, these are things that I know to be bad for the environment, but I do, um, especially driving on a very regular basis. Um, but I think I personally feel that I have an obligation to at least try. And my form of trying so far is working on one species that lives in one mountain range in one country. Um, and that already feels like a fairly overwhelming task. Um, so being able to illustrate a children's book that again may get in more people's hands than the scientific publications that maybe 50 people will read in their lifetime if, if I'm lucky um, it is really great. And if conversations can be had um, between children and their parents about insects and just paying attention to the world around them, I think that first step of um, observation uh, can be followed by stewardship and that can, can lead to a lot of really positive places that I think are really worthwhile. I think it's, uh, I don't know if it's funny or it's just, you know, it's um, enlightening because you hear a lot of, you know, uh, novice writers or even, you know, mid-career writers um, getting into, uh, you know, like writing journals, you know, through, through university presses or, you know, uh, middle tier presses and things like that and are also worried that, you know, that, you know, 25 people will pick up this, this book and, and read it and, you know, the voice and my, my message has been coming across and um, are not getting spread out. Um, so I think it's a sort of a shared concern on that level, right, between, um, you know, science writing, you know, maybe just writing in general, right? Um, but I wonder, because, you know, this is a sort of a hybrid between those two things, you know, bringing uh, science and the arts together extremely well here. Are, are there other areas, you know, that you would sort of, that you would like to see this type of hybrid, uh, you know, maybe more on like an adult level, uh, as opposed to like a children's picture book or, um, you know, that relationship working? Well, I mean, all the collaborations I've had with non-scientists have been really fun. Um, so for example, when I was at, uh, I, I used to, when I was a postdoctoral researcher, I worked in Annie Leonard's uh, Bumblebee lab at University of Nevada, Reno. And she was contacted by an LA based artist called Jessica Rath, who came to the lab and spent uh, about a week, I think, uh, learning about our research, reading papers on bees and flowers and pollination. And then she made this amazing art installation back in LA of uh, a, whole load, there were a whole load of different things. There were giant anthers. There was something you went into where you kind of experienced what it would be like being a bee flying through different colors. Um, there was these life-size bumblebee colony essentially that would also had, was paired with sound art. Um, and it was amazing. And obviously, as us as bee scientists going to see the art installation was like it was like Disneyland for us. It was the best best day ever. Um, but it was also then used for school kids to come through the art museum. And so there were all these different classes coming through. And so that was a way, right, that the kids are interacting and experiencing art, but through it you know, being like, what is that? Oh, that's a giant anther, what are anthers? And learning about the science at the same time. And probably in a way that is so much more compelling than they would have if they were just looking at pictures in textbook at school, right? And so I think that there, these kinds of collaborations are so fruitful and um, yeah, and, and really valuable. And I think um, not necessarily for different age groups, but with different subject matter, um, I definitely have gears in my head that turn about making uh, picture books about um, the immune system and disease. And I know it's a dangerous thing to say, but uh, I really like disease. I don't like what it does, um, but the way that 
bodies uh, and immune systems function to fight disease is really intricate and fascinating and really applicable to humans. I study disease and wildlife, um, but I think we, we all very much feel um, having or still <laughs> being in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, how terrible disease can be and how important it is to have um, good, accurate information that feels trustworthy um, and accessible, but you know, also that is relatable and, and makes sense. And dispelling all of the different crazy corners of molecule cascades in the immune system and how that works would be quite the challenge and undertaking. Um, but I think, again, having that feel more approachable uh, and explained in a different way could have a lot of positive power in, in the future. That's awesome. That's that's very well said. Um, yeah, I mean, it just generally we seem to not know enough. I guess <laughs> right. It'd be great to to know more about uh, disease and, and bees and everything and um, the immersive experiences. I think. Uh, sorry, I'm playing with my earphones there. Um, are, are wonderful. I know that, but uh, in Reno they have the um, at the Arboretum. There's the museum, and then they bring in um, things like that. Um, and in San Francisco, the Exploratorium and, and you know the immersive science, you know, an opera of information and science and experience, which is is wonderful, um, and which is happening on on a smaller scale in Am I Even a B, uh, which is a beautiful book and a show to get here. Um, once again, this is available uh, April fifth. Uh, from your local uh, independent bookstore and now available for pre-order. Um, before we take off here, you know, thank you once again to everyone that showed up and to uh, Alexa and Felicity. Um, I would remind everybody to go back to earlier in the video uh, to see the amazing organizations um, and uh, places to learn more about uh, promoting bees in your, in your backyard. Um, and uh, I was going to leave it if there was, you know, a note of advocacy um, that either of you had as far as, you know, uh, ways to get the, the broader word out for folks that are both interested in the, uh, the arts and the sciences. Uh, would you have a uh, simple recommendation for that? I mean, obviously, it should just be to buy the book. <laughs> Aside from that, no, I think just talking about these things, right? Because I feel like whenever I'm, I don't know, down the pub and I get chatting to somebody and obviously I say, you know, I'm a bee biologist and then people start telling me about honeybees. I, I love that people are, are enthusiastic. I love that people have, you know, watched honeybee hives and can tell me about their behavior and honeybees are an amazing animal. So I don't want to diminish them in any way. They can do all kinds of amazing things and they're so useful for us in so many ways. But then when I tell people about all the native bees, people are often just so surprised and, and want to know more. And so I think that, um, you know, if you've seen this or when you read the book, if this is something that sticks with you, just to, just to tell other people and to spread the word, because I think that it's something that, that people are excited to hear about. And uh, yeah. And I would say just continue observation uh, for yourself and for your children. and that could come in the form of buying a simple, easy to use guidebook and going out for a local walk or hike. And I think you'll be really surprised that once you know the names of two or three of the most common species, whether they're plants or birds or small mammals in your area, that you'll see them everywhere. Or maybe you'll find that you don't see them in some places, or maybe seeing some of them um, will make you notice other things that you never ever saw before. And uh, that awareness of your surroundings can be really eye-opening in a, a really fulfilling way. And the second is bring a sketchbook with you or commit to one month of sketching for 15 or 30 minutes every day. It doesn't matter if they're terrible, it doesn't matter if you never show them to anyone and throw it away at the end of the month. Uh, but if you're trying to find space for art in your life, even when you're busy, um, there, there are small ways where you can achieve that. And I think that is an excellent spot to uh, say thank you to you both again and uh, say farewell to all of us joining us live.
uh, and thank you for uh, uh, joining us today. And uh, thank you, Small Fair, again. Um, everyone have a pleasant day, and thank you for joining Arts and Sciences with uh, Alexa.